Why does this system architecture pattern seem cost effective and infinitely scalable, but it's actually a massive trap that you should avoid at all costs? Please do not fall for this one, unless, you know, this look is your thing. And why would I use this pattern for a toy side project that will likely never have any users, or maybe just a handful of users? It might not be the reason you think. This is also one of the patterns that I might use for applications that do need to scale, those that maybe need to handle hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands of users. So let's break all of this down. Okay, so this is kind of what everyone starts with, and there's a pervasive argument that the vast majority of apps don't need anything more than this. Kind of true, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you should build this way. We'll get to that. In this scenario, you might not have an automated build. You might build on your local machine and manually copy the binaries to the host that's going to serve your application. In this situation, your scalability is limited to upgrading your cloud instance to a bigger one. And to be fair, in terms of the ability to handle traffic, you could probably get pretty far with just one of the largest cloud instance. But if you need to upgrade your infrastructure, you're going to have downtime. And even worse, every time you update your application, you're going to have downtime because you need to stop everything copy the new binaries to the instance and start your app again. Of course, that might not be a big deal if your original assertion that you don't have any users is true. Okay, the next evolution of this whole thing is adding CI/CD or continuous integration and continuous deployment. I almost didn't mention this because I think this day and age, pretty much everyone is on board with this one. The lines between CI and CD can be a little bit blurry, but generally speaking, here's the breakdown. CI is continuous integration. What does that include? Number one, automated builds when code is committed. You push a change, a build happens. Number two, automated tests when that build is complete. And number three, some kind of notification to developers when either of those things fail. Of course, depending on who you talk to, CI might encompass other things, but that's kind of the meat of it. And then there's a CD. Once the build completes and all the tests pass, we have some agent that automatically deploys a new application binary to the hosting platform. In this case, that's just a plain EC2 instance. In a lot of cases, the automatic deployment will happen to some test environment instead of being deployed directly to production, and sometimes some automated integration tests will be run in that environment, hopefully. Then depending on the situation, the new binary might be automatically deployed to production at that point, which is continuous deployment. But in a lot of cases, there is actually a human approval step between deploying to the test environment and deploying to the final production environment. If there is a manual approval step where the human has to click a button to actually deploy to production, then it's called continuous delivery instead of continuous deployment. Okay, that's CI CD. Okay, now we start to get into the managed hosting platforms. There's nothing here that you couldn't technically do manually, but the platform makes it way, way easier and frankly, nobody that I know of really does this stuff manually anymore. So now we have a load balancer. The external world connects to your app through this load balancer, and its job is to distribute requests between one or more instances, each of which are running your application. You get a few things out of all this. First of all, your application can now handle a higher volume of requests than it could with just one instance. The load balancer can distribute requests amongst each of the running instances using various strategies. It sounds kind of weird, but random distribution of requests usually works fine. Do note that for this sort of load balancing to be possible, you do need to make sure your application is stateless such that it doesn't matter if the client's requests are handled by a different instance each time. So you can't do any weird stuff like in-memory caching or things like that. Many deployment platforms, including Elastic Beanstalk, support a concept of automatic scaling. And what that means is that you set up some rules around when the automatic scaling should happen. It could be based on some metric like number of requests or CPU usage. And then when the threshold on that metric is reached, the platform automatically creates another instance, deploys your application on it, and registers that instance with the load balancer in an effort to handle the higher traffic volume. So in this case, what it would do is create a new instance, make a fourth instance there, and then we'll add that fourth instance to the load balancer. Boom, there it goes. So we decided that three instances was not sufficient to handle the current traffic load. So we spun up a new instance, instance four, registered that with a load balancer, and now requests are being distributed evenly across those four nodes. Okay, at this point we're in a pretty good place, but it's easy to see what the main bottleneck is now. It's the database. Scaling the database can be tricky if you haven't planned for it from the beginning because it could have an impact around how you design your schema. When we talk about scaling the database, there are really two distinct reasons we'd wanna do that. One is if your application's data set can't fit onto one instance. And in that case, you'll need to do what's called sharding, which is splitting your data across multiple database nodes. As you can imagine, there's a lot of complexity around that. What if I have three nodes and I need to add another node? How do I redistribute the data such that each node has an equal part of it? Another reason you'd wanna scale up the database is simply to handle a higher traffic volume. So basically the idea is to distribute requests across nodes 
similar to what we're already doing with these application instances behind the load balancer. If you chose a key value or document database like AWS DynamoDB or one of its analogs, this is not going to be a big deal at all because both of those things are handled automatically for you. You get fault tolerance, load balancing, and sharding of your data all automatically. They do impose some extra constraints on your schema that you wouldn't have with a SQL database, but Generally speaking, my general thought is if the structure of your data allows you to go with one of these types of databases, you probably should because it makes scaling so much easier. To scale up and down, you don't really need to do anything other than possibly change some configuration to handle the new traffic volume. And you might not even have to do that because they do have auto scaling capabilities. If you chose a SQL database, things might get a little more interesting. If two things are true, then you're probably going to be okay. Number one, your application doesn't require a high volume of writes. And number two, your application's entire data set will always fit in one database instance. If both of those things are true, then you can just set up what's called a single master multiple replica database cluster. Generally, you don't have to change anything in your application logic to get this working. The way this works is that all database writes are done to this master instance. And then these read replicas receive database state updates from the master whenever something changes. And then all database read queries are load balance amongst these replica instances, and in some cases, the master too. In this setup, the master database instance is still the bottleneck for writes to the database, and your entire data set is copied to every instance. So if your data doesn't fit on a single instance, this setup isn't going to help, which leads me out of my comfort zone because there is such thing as multi-master SQL. This is something I haven't personally tried, so please let me know in the comments if you've had a good experience with a multi-master SQL setup. But from what I can tell, it seems like you have to make some kind of concession in most cases, either in terms of performance or schema design. AWS RDS does have a multi-master offering called Aurora Multi-Master, but it only aims to address the problem of distributing write requests. It doesn't provide any sharding capabilities. Then there's something called Vitesse, which sort of allows you to have a multi-master cluster of MySQL databases. It does allow your data to be sharded, but apparently it's not completely automatic. And there's a maximum of one master node per shard, so that might limit your write capacity. My understanding is that a database called CockroachDB aims to provide load balancing of writes and automatic sharding. This is the one that to me, at least on paper, seemed to have the least number of drawbacks. I haven't tried it, so please, anyone that's used it, please let me know in the comments what you think of it. Okay, those are the options for scaling your database. Long story short, if you chose a database and a schema that provides automatic sharding and load balancing of write requests, this is gonna be far, far easier. Once you have your database scaled up, you're in a pretty good place. I think in a lot of cases, this could be a viable end game setup that can handle massive traffic volumes. Before we look at another architecture, this is how I like to think of deployment platforms. In terms of platforms where the developer handles everything, that's EC2, you're responsible for installing operating system updates, how files are copied to the instance, and how to actually start your service. I don't think anybody does this anymore. Then we have Elastic Beanstalk, which we talked about earlier, and that's kind of on the right side of the spectrum. What that means is you simply give it your application binary. In Java, that would be a WAR file. For a Node application, that would be basically your entire source tree. And the idea is that Elastic Beanstalk is aware of specific frameworks and patterns in each ecosystem. For example, it knows how to host a WAR file using Tomcat or launch a JAR file that contains a Spring Boot application. It kind of bends over backwards for the developer, the idea being that as long as the developer abides by some reasonable rules, they have to do less legwork to make their application deployable. So keeping all that in mind, our next architecture is going to be similar to the last one, but instead of using a framework or a deployment platform, we're going to use a containerized deployment platform. We're going to assume that we went with a scalable key value store for our database, so we don't have to worry about scaling issues. There are generic standards around containers, but at the time this video is being made, we're likely talking about Docker images. Instead of caring what language and framework your project uses, the deployment platform says, give me a container image, and I'll spin up containers from that image. Pretty much every cloud provider offers some hosting platform that accepts container images as input. On AWS, the two main ones are ECS, or Elastic Container Service, and EKS, or Elastic Kubernetes Service. This approach offers a lot more flexibility in terms of your tech stack. The downside is that you have to write a Docker file that describes how instances need to be set up to run your application, but it's definitely not a large amount of overhead. Docker files are fairly straightforward. And depending on your tech stack, you might be required to go this route if your particular stack isn't supported by any framework-aware deployment platforms. The other advantage of using containers is that it opens the door to using Kubernetes, which is nice because it gives you fine-grained control over which containers get deployed together, how containers communicate with each other, and so on. Yeah, outside the scope of this video, long story short, Kubernetes is actually really powerful. 
The icing on the cake and something you could argue that most apps probably won't need is a content delivery network. The easiest way to think about content delivery networks or CDNs is that they're just in-memory cache that's located as close to the end users as possible. When a user resolves the DNS address of your application, DNS returns the IP of the CDN geographically nearest to them. If the CDN has a cache result for the request they made, it will just respond to the user directly with that result instead of routing the request all the way to your backend. If the CDN doesn't have a cache result, it then forwards your request to the backend where it's handled as usual. This can really speed up the user experience in addition to taking some of the load off your backend infrastructure. Okay, the setup we have here is pretty solid. In all likelihood, this can take you as far as you wanna go. At the time I'm making this video, this is the architecture that I like to aim for because I think it's a perfect blend of elastic scalability, cost effectiveness, and low maintenance overhead. But if you don't wanna stop there, there are some other options. Whether they are better or not really depends on your requirements and to some degree, your subjective opinion. But first, now that we have our potential end game system architecture, there's a bit of a fallacy that I wanna dispel in this video. And this fallacy comes in a few forms, but all of them are pretty similar. Something like, I won't have any users, so I don't need to worry about scalability, or this is just a side project, so it doesn't need to scale. The point that I wanna make is that even if your application won't scale, it should scale, but not for the reason that you might think. It's not necessarily because you might unexpectedly get more users than you can handle. You probably won't. There's more to it than that. There's this common misconception that building with scale in mind will require extra thought and will make every project take longer. It does require some extra thought, but that extra thought isn't really on a per project basis. Once you internalize the basic concepts around building for scale, I'd argue that building things with scale in mind doesn't really add any extra scope to the project. It just takes a bit of time up front to learn the concepts, and after that one-time investment, incorporating scalability into your project shouldn't really add any scope. That's my take anyway. That's why I think even toy or side projects should be built with scale in mind. Okay, next architecture pattern, serverless. Yeah, I didn't forget about it. Here's the serverless analog of what we've been doing so far. Instead of a load balancer, we have what you might think of as a lightweight proxy. In AWS, this would be API Gateway. Then instead of our container platform, we have our static files, HTML and JavaScript in an S3 bucket. And for our APIs, we have serverless functions. In AWS, that would be AWS Lambda. Notice that I took out the CDN box. You can still have a CDN if you configure your API Gateway to be edge optimized. So that's still kind of there. First, let's talk about the advantages of this approach. There are a few things that you could argue are advantages. First, if nobody's using your application, the only thing you'd technically pay for is for the static files in the S3 bucket and for the data that you're storing in your database, if you're using a cloud database, of course. If you're using container instances, which are likely using an EC2 instance per container, you'd be paying for that EC2 instance even if nobody's making requests to it. The other thing is that elastic scalability is much more granular than in the previous architecture. Each instance might represent a certain number of requests per second that you can handle. Say each instance can handle 100 transactions per second, but at a certain time of the day, you need to handle 301 transactions per second. So technically you need four containers to have the capacity. You're paying for that fourth instance, even though it's almost not needed. Also, you need to be careful about setting up your scaling criteria. Otherwise, when traffic dies down and your containers don't get spun down, that means you're paying for extra containers that you don't need. And even worse, if your traffic volume goes up and you don't add more containers in time to handle that traffic, you might have an outage on your hands. These are the things that serverless functions aim to fix. They are great at handling sporadic traffic. For example, if you suddenly get a thousand requests all at once after hours of no traffic at all, they should be able to handle scenarios like that. You also pay on a per request basis, so you're always paying for exactly the amount of traffic that you're handling. Unless your traffic volume is pretty high, this is probably cheaper than the containerized equivalent. There is a really good article comparing EC2 with Lambda in terms of costs and capacity. I'll link it in the description if you'd like to check it out. But without going into too much detail, there is a threshold in traffic volume at which using EC2 becomes cheaper than using Lambda. This article was actually written back in 2018, so the actual thresholds might have changed somewhat since then, but my understanding is that the basic premise still stands. If you have a ton of traffic, serverless functions might not make sense anymore. Now the picture I painted at this point is use serverless functions if your traffic is sparse. Use container instances if your traffic is above whatever that threshold is. Unfortunately, there are some other downsides of serverless that you need to consider even if your traffic volume is low. The main one is something called cold starts. At any given time, the cloud provider has a certain number of instances of your function ready to handle requests. 
Of course, they always want to have the bare minimum number of instances of your function ready at any given time. So when one of those instances hasn't been run for five to 10 minutes, it will basically deprovision that instance. When you run the serverless function and all existing instances of that function are busy, it'll provision a new one reactively to handle the new request. Consequently, that particular run of the function is going to take longer than it otherwise would. And if the user experience of your app relies directly on serverless functions being run, the user is going to have a less than ideal experience. Is it going to make your application horribly slow? Probably not. But if you wanna provide the absolute best experiences for your users, even if it means slightly higher costs, it might be hard to justify using serverless functions. That leads me to a setup that you should never, ever, ever use. Microservice architecture has been all the rage for a while now, and it can be tempting to think of your serverless functions as microservices. With containerized instances, it's not that big of a deal if your microservices need to make requests to each other to handle requests from the front end. But if your microservices are serverless functions, this can absolutely destroy you, and you might not realize it until you've built everything on the serverless platform. The problem here is that cold starts can snowball. If fulfilling a request requires three different lambdas to be run, that means that request might potentially take one second or more to receive a response. The other thing to note is that the size of the application binary that you provide to Lambda actually has an impact on the cold start time. The larger the binary, the longer the cold starts. Combine that with these chains of Lambda executions and you're gonna have a bad time. What makes it worse is that your binary could start out small and so you have this illusion of safety for a while and then one day you need to add a large dependency and then you realize you're SOL because that new dependency causes cold start times to skyrocket. And then at that point, you need to rethink your entire architecture. If you're going to use serverless functions, a good rule of thumb is, at least for code paths that impact the user experience, never have a serverless function invoke another serverless function. I hope all this has given you a new perspective on system architecture, some of the trade-offs of different approaches, and I also hope it's convinced you that you should always build with scalability in mind even when the thing you're building isn't going to be, you know, the next Netflix or something. Please let me know in the comments if there's anything important that I've missed or if there's something I didn't get quite right. Also, I'd love to hear about your experiences with building scalable systems, like what has worked for you, and I'm especially interested in any traps that you might have fallen into that you'd like to steer others away from so they don't have to go through the pain that you went through. Rust is a great language to use when building systems that need to scale, and full stack Rust frameworks have been getting really good lately, and I feel like the industry hasn't really caught on to it yet. If that sounds interesting to you, definitely check out this video where I compare the two most popular open source full stack frameworks in the Rust ecosystem. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.